This is the Music History In-Depth Podcast for September 4th through the 10th. On this week's show, American Idol gets huge. One of the most popular duos of all time reunites on a telethon, and we say happy birthday to a few legends, including the Queen Bee herself. This show goes more in depth about some of the events that we put on our daily podcast, the Music History Today podcast, which drops every single day, including weekends, wherever you get your podcast from. Now, on to this week's episode. In 2002, producer Simon Fuller convinced Fox Television to try something new for American television. He was going around town trying to sell a reality music competition show with the winner getting a recording contract. The idea wasn't really anything new. Fuller based his idea on a popular British show called Pop Idol, but America had not had a music competition show on television in quite some time. In fact, the last one was the 1980s mainstay, Star Search, with Ed McMahon, That, but that was actually only in weekend daytime television. It wasn't a primetime thing. Nevertheless, Fox bit on the idea and decided to make it a summer show. That wasn't very encouraging to Fuller, since summer at that time in history was basically a dumping ground for reruns because regular television shows started in September and ran until May when they had their season finales. Occasionally, the summer TV season would produce a breakout hit like Survivor, but the conventional wisdom was that no one watched television in the summer because everybody was outside. The first season for this show had music executive Simon Cowell, record producer and one-time bassist for the rock group Journey, at least for one album, during its Raised on Radio tour, Randy Jackson, and choreographer and early 90s singing sensation Paula Abdul. The hosts for the show, plural, were a radio DJ at the time called Ryan Seacrest and a comedian named Brian Dunkelman. More on him later. The show debuted on Fox on June 11, 2002. The show became an immediate hit. Each week, the audience grew and grew, and on September 4, 2002, the show held its championship round live with a studio audience to huge television ratings. With 58% of the vote, a then-unknown Kelly Clarkson beat out runner-up Justin Guarini. The show itself would become a staple of American television and pop culture for 16 years. It would make multimillionaires and stars of everybody associated with it. It would also inspire a lot of competition shows, both musical like The Voice and X Factor, and non-musical like Top Chef, etc., etc., etc. The show would also create a lot of controversy. Let's get back to Brian Dunkelman. Right after the end of the first season, Dunkelman quit the show right before he could be fired. Also, right before the show made everybody associated with it mega rich, which unfortunately has given Dunkelman the nickname the Pete Best of American Idol. Anyway, Dunkelman said he quit because he didn't like the way the producers treated the contestants, doing everything from staging fights between them to putting fake tears in their eyes for tight camera shots of them crying. In short, much like a lot of reality television shows, he said it was faked. What couldn't be faked, regardless, was the amount of talent that was coming out of the show, at least for the first few seasons. Along with Kelly Clarkson, you had Jennifer Hudson, Carrie Underwood, Catherine McPhee, Chris Daughtry, Adam Lambert, and Fantasia, just a few of the names who made it big from that show. The show did routinely, though, become a victim of its own success as young female voters routinely voted off better qualified female contestants in favor of cute male contestants. You know, you would have figured that would have worked the other way around. Guess not. Oh, well. 
Plus, don't forget about the guy who sang badly, very, very badly, Ricky Martin's hit song, She Bangs, and then became a singing sensation himself when his audition was shown for one episode. That was proof that you didn't even need to be good to be on this show. And soon, people were purposely singing bad and being bad in hopes that they would be shown on the first few elimination audition shows. Also, think about this. Name anyone who won American Idol in the past six seasons or so. I bet you can't. Nor can you name a winner of any of the competition shows like The Voice or any of the other shows. The problem is that they've all been now kind of disposable. You win, you get your 15 seconds of fame in this day and age, and then you're gone. That's it. Nothing more. So be it. Kind of sad, actually. Now, American Idol is no longer on Fox. It's now switched over to ABC television. Seems to be doing pretty well, I guess. But nothing will beat its first season when it stormed right out of the gate, reaching its zenith during the first season finale, which was held on September 4th, 2002. Before we go any further, we'd like to tell you about our other podcasts. The Music History Today podcast goes over the daily events in music history and drops daily, including weekends, on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. There's also the Music Halls of Fame podcast, which talks about a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, along with other Music Halls of Fame's museums and walks of fame. The Music Halls of Fame podcast drops every Thursday and can also be found on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to this podcast. Our next story is about a reunion of a duo that had its heyday in the 1940s and 1950s. In 1945, Dean Martin was a nightclub singer. Jerry Lewis was a comedian who routinely made fun of the music that was playing around him. They decided to team up together when the scheduled singer didn't show up one night in 1946 at the 500 Club in Atlantic City, New Jersey. At first, the duo show wasn't really all that good, so they just started winging it and did vaudeville and slapstick comedy. That act worked, and they became mainstays at the club. Word spread, and soon they were doing the nightclub circuit. Lewis would constantly interrupt Martin's singing, and Martin would get angry and chase Lewis all over the place. Hollywood soon came calling, and that's when things really took off. Martin and Lewis had a radio show, which paid them very well, and that led to them doing some movies. All of this made them extremely popular. For instance, just check out footage online of them hanging out the windows at the Paramount Theater in Times Square while Thousands, and I do mean thousands, of women screamed at them from the streets. These guys were actually humongously popular. Unfortunately, like a lot of partnerships slash relationships, things get strained. Martin grew tired of being Lewis's straight man to Lewis's crazy antics, so they broke up rather angrily on July 25th, 1956 exactly 10 years to the day of their first performance together. Martin, of course, went on to have huge success of his own in the movies and also with a group of guys who did crazy nightclub antics of their own. Those guys were called the Rat Pack. You may have heard of them, Frank Sinatra, Sammy Davis Jr., Joey Bishop, etc., etc., Meanwhile, Lewis went on to become a movie star in films like The Nutty Professor and The Bellboy and say things like, Hey, lady, pretty lady, and stuff like that. Lewis would also become involved in a charity organization. Back in 1951, he and Martin participated in the first telethon for a cardiac hospital. Lewis continued to do telethons for various causes, and then, on September 4th and 5th, 1966, he started hosting the Labor Day Telethon to benefit the Muscular Dystrophy Association. 
the show would become a Labor Day staple until Lewis was dismissed rather unceremoniously from the association in 2011. Lewis raised hundreds of millions of dollars for the MDA over those decades with his trusty sidekick, Ed McMahon. They used to call the kids Jerry's Kids. It was a Labor Day staple. I remember watching it every single Labor Day when I was a kid. It was during one of these telethon broadcasts that Lewis got a surprise. On September 6, 1976, Lewis's good friend, Frank Sinatra, was on the telethon when he stopped for a minute and asked Lewis if he could bring a friend out who wanted to do a song. Lewis said, sure. And then out walked Dean Martin from the wings of the stage. The audience gave them a standing ovation. The two old friends hugged. They hadn't really spoken in just over 20 years at that point. They joked around on stage for a few minutes in an awkward but touching moment. And then after the reunion, they talked and kept in touch until Dean's death in 1995. Jerry Lewis passed on in 2017. The reunion of two of the biggest stars of the early 1950s took place on September 6, 1976 on the Jerry Lewis Labor Day Telethon for muscular dystrophy, those two stars, Mr. Jerry Lewis and Mr. Dean Martin. On to the birthdays this week. The first one's legacy is already clearly being defined. She was born on September 4, 1981. She started out performing and singing in dance competitions. However, she would first make her name for herself as part of a girl group that was managed by her father. After the group broke up in 2006, she found further success as a solo artist, selling over 100 million copies to go along with 60 million copies sold as part of the group. Even her sister is talented. Also, her sister has a mean kick and a good right hook. Just ask the woman's husband. She is part of a Hollywood power couple who together are worth well over a billion dollars by now. Almost two, actually. The ex-member of the group Destiny's Child with a singing and acting career for the ages. Jay-Z's much better and more talented half, I might say. It's Beyonce's birthday. Born September 4th, 1981. Otis Redding was born on September 9th, 1941. He has been called one of the greatest singers of popular music ever. He was a member of Little Richard's backup band, The Upsetters, for a time, and also Johnny Jenkins' band, The Pine Toppers. He started recording as a solo artist in 1962 with Stax Records. His first single was the classic These Arms of Mine in 1962. In 1964, he put out his debut album, Pain in My Heart. What followed was an incredible amount of album and touring production. In fact, as far as touring went, he toured the South and Europe continuously for the better part of the decade, all the while recording song after song after song. In 1964 and 1965, Otis put out three albums. These Arms of Mine was 64. In March of 65, he put out his second album, The Great Otis Redding Sings Soul Ballads. That album had Otis's first big hit, Mr. Pitiful. While on tour to support this album, Otis started working on songs that would become part of his next album. He decided that most of the songs would be cover versions of soul songs, and three of the original songs were co-written by him. I've Been Loving You Too Long, Respect, and Old Man Trouble. Respect would be slowed down, of course, and covered by Aretha Franklin, who did her classic rendition of it. The entire album was recorded in three days. It started on April 19th and then finished on July 9th and 10th. He was backed up by members of the Memphis Horns, the Bar Kays, and Booker T and the MGs. And that album, Otis Blue, Otis Redding Sing Soul, was released on September 15, 1965. 
Although the album only made it to number 75 on the Billboard Albums charts, three of the singles became top 40 staples. I've Been Loving You Too Long, Respect, and Shake. The album is considered one of the greatest albums of all time, even though most of it is actually cover versions. After Otis Blue, Otis's career started going stronger and stronger. By 1967, Otis was hitting his stride, and after years of being the workhorse for Stax Records, he was finally getting his due. His gravelly vocals, plus his sex appeal and energetic performances, were winning over audiences worldwide. He started off by breaking through at the Monterey Rock Festival in 1967. That would be the same festival who saw The Who and Jimi Hendrix rise to prominence from it. Aretha Franklin had made a hit out of his song, Respect. Redding was getting some respect of his own with songs like Try a Little Tenderness. Otis was starting to achieve crossover stardom finally. On December 10, 1967, Redding left a Memphis recording studio having worked on the song Sitting on the Dock of the Bay, which would end up being his biggest hit. He didn't have time to finish recording the lyrics for the end of the song, so he just whistled the melody, intending to finish recording the lyrics when he got back from a trip. He needed to get to a TV performance in Cleveland, Ohio, and then do a concert in Madison, Wisconsin. So, in order to accomplish this, he took a private plane, which is never a good idea for a musician, just saying. As the plane approached the runway in Madison, it crashed into a small lake, killing Otis and all but one person on the plane. Otis Redding was 36 years old. The song Sitting on the Dock of the Bay was released after his death and became the first posthumous song to hit number one on the Billboard singles chart. The Life and Times of the Legendary Soul Man, Mr. Otis Redding, who was born on September 9, 1941. This next man was born Farouk Bolsara on the island of Zanzibar in East Africa on September 5, 1946. Back in the late 1960s, while in art college, young Farouk became friends with bassist Tim Staffel, who was in a band called Smile. Farouk became a fan of the band and ended up joining them when Staffel left the band to form another band. Farouk joined the band and did two name changes. The first was that he persuaded the rest of the members of the band, who were guitarist Brian May and drummer Roger Taylor, to change the name of the group from Smile to Queen. The second was that Farouk Bulsara changed his name to Freddie Mercury. Queen played with different bassists for a couple of years until they found the perfect bassist in John Deacon. In 1973, the band signed a record deal and released their debut album, Queen. The critics liked the progressive metal sound of the band, but the public didn't find the album, even with the now well-known lead single from that album, Keep Yourself Alive. Their second album, Queen 2, found success both with critics and the general public. That album had the classic Seven Seas of Rye. In 1974, the band released Sheer Heart Attack, which gave them even bigger success with songs like Killer Queen, Now I'm Here, and Stone Cold Crazy. Album number four came out in 1975. A Night at the Opera became a worldwide smash. The album had the hits Love of My Life, You're My Best Friend, and another song that would chart top three times in America, the second time with the help of a movie about two kids with a cable access television show, and the third time with the help of an Academy Award winning performance. According to historians, some of the ideas for the song Bohemian Rhapsody were formulated in the late 1960s, especially the beginning part where the singer of the song talks about the fact that he just killed a man. The song, all planned out by Freddie beforehand, starts with a 49-second intro, then goes into an almost two-minute ballad, then Brian May's 25-second guitar solo, then the one-minute opera that everyone and their grandmother loved singing in a car, then a quick little 47-second rock portion, and has a one-minute ending. 
all totaled. It is five minutes, 55 seconds of a mini rock opera about a guy who accidentally killed a man, sold his soul to the devil, then called God to help save him. That would be the opera portion in the center. The band started recording the song in late August of 1975, and it took about three weeks to record. They had rehearsed it about three weeks beforehand. They layered in over 100 different tracks onto the song. Brian May's guitar solo, though, is all him, one track only. The record label, as you can imagine, was not pleased with a six-minute song. They thought it didn't fit into that cookie-cutter four minutes or less corporate radio world, so the band took the song to Capitol Radio DJ Kenny Everett, who ended up playing it on air. He teased it first, though, by playing little bits of the song until the public just wanted more and more. Gave him a little taste, as it were. It then got picked up by other radio stations, and after that, Queens' record label, Elektra, released the song on October 31st, 1975. Bohemian Rhapsody became a huge hit, especially in England, where it went to number one. In America, it did not go to number one. It went top ten number nine to be precise, at least in its initial run. The song, of course, has sold over 30 million copies worldwide to date, probably even more by now, actually. The music video that was made for the song is also considered a template of how music videos were made back in the 1970s. The song has been popularized a few more times. The first was during the unfortunate early death of Freddie Mercury from complications from AIDS in 1991 when it finally hit number one in America when it was released with the song These Are the Days of Our Lives as a double A-side single in late 1991. The second time it was re-released was when a movie called Wayne's World came out about two guys who had a cable access television show that used the song in the now famous head banging in the car scene. The third time it got popular again was in the past few years when the band's biopic Bohemian Rhapsody with a Best Actor Academy Award winning performance by Rami Malek as the late great Freddie Mercury took the song back to the top 10 in the UK. After that, the band became dominant in the late 1970s into the early 1980s with albums A Day at the Races, News of the World, Jazz, the game, the works, and a kind of magic. They also had hit soundtracks for the movies Flash Gordon, Iron Eagle, and Highlander. And of course, if you saw the movie, then you know about the band's popularity starting to go down in America as New Wave took over the industry. As a matter of fact, even though a bunch of their songs are considered classics and are classic rock radio staples here in America, those songs were not hugely popular when they were originally released, much like a lot of songs these days that are considered to be some of the greatest songs ever written. Regardless of how they were perceived commercially and on the charts in America, they were still a big touring draw and were hugely popular in England, continuously racking up top 10 albums and singles. Of course, remember their legendary performance at Live Aid as proof of their popularity in the UK. Freddie's health started to deteriorate from the effects of AIDS as he fronted the band's final couple of albums in the early 1990s. And you can definitely see the beating his body took in the band's video for the song, These Are the Days of Our Lives. Watching him will leave you with more than a few tears in your eyes, I'm just saying. After Freddie's death on November 24, 1991, the band held a tribute concert at Wembley Stadium, site of their legendary Live Aid performance. And then the group marched on with different lead singers, including Robbie Williams from Take That, before finally landing on American Idol contestant Adam Lambert. Hey, we spoke about him a couple segments ago. And they have been touring ever since. Although bassist John Deacon retired from the band touring in 1997 and has since become an integral part of their behind-the-scenes operation. Queen are one of the biggest-selling musical artists of all time, with claimed sales of up to 300 million copies and are the third best-selling band in England. 
Rolling Stone voted Freddie the second greatest frontman of all time and the 18th greatest singer of all time, while voting the band the 52nd greatest artists of all time. Queen put out 14 studio albums during Freddie's tenure as frontman, along with two live albums, two greatest hits albums, and two box sets. There have been a bunch of all those different types of albums that have been released since Freddie passed away in order to cash in on the group's legacy. Of the albums that were released while Freddie was alive, at least, five hit the top ten in America with 1980's The Game hitting number one. That's the one with Another One Bites the Dust on it. In the UK, it is, of course, a completely different story, with 17 albums hitting the top ten, including nine hitting the top spot. As far as singles that were released while Freddie was alive, 53 were released, with five hitting the top ten in America, including Crazy Little Thing Called Love, Another One Bites the Dust, and the aforementioned 1991 re-release of Bohemian Rhapsody, which hit number one. In the UK, of course, a completely different story yet again, as they had 20 songs hit the top ten, including four number ones. The Life and Times of the Icon, Freddie Mercury of the group Queen, born September 5th, 1946. Finally, Tim Bergling was born on September 8th, 1989 in Sweden. Tim decided to get into DJing due to his brother, who was already a DJ. By the time he was 18, Tim was signed to a record label. He started working under the guidance of DJ Laidback Luke. He then struck out on his own as a producer and remixer. In 2010, at the age of 21, Tim tried to set up his social media accounts through MySpace. Ah, remember MySpace. Those were good days. However, Tim found out that his name was already taken on MySpace. And he desperately needed a stage name, so he took the name from the Buddhist name for the lowest level of hell called Avicii. He added an extra I to it to differentiate himself from the lowest level of hell, mind you. And, of course, the legend of Avicii was born. In 2010, Avicii released the first big single from his called Seek Bromance, which went top 10 all throughout Europe. In 2011, he put out the song Levels. That song went top 10 in Europe and was also nominated for a Best Dance Recording Grammy. It is also considered to be the greatest EDM single ever made, at least according to some. In 2012, he and David Guetta put out the song Sunshine. That song was nominated for a Best Dance Recording Grammy as well. That would be Avicii's second year in a row pulling that feat. He then tried to stop the release of Leona Lewis's song Collide because it used his song Fade Into Darkness without permission. Shocker. As part of Avicii doing festival DJing, including a memorable set at the 2012 Ultra Miami Music Festival, he debuted new songs that year with Madonna and Lenny Kravitz. And from there, Avicii went on a roll. He was the first DJ to do a concert at Radio City Music Hall in New York City. In 2013, he released the album True. That album had the song that would turn him into an international superstar. The song, Wake Me Up, which spent 14 weeks at the top of the Billboard dance charts. His follow-up single, Hey Brother, was almost as popular. In 2015, he released the album Stories, which he had teased at festivals all throughout 2014. Throughout the next three years, Avicii continued to put out music and collaborate with other artists. However... His festival and club DJing were beginning to take a toll on him, so he retired from doing them. It turns out that his mental health and stress issues went back to at least 2014, when he was hospitalized and had to miss his closing set at one of the Ultra Music Festivals. He would continue to fight with mental health issues until April 20, 2018, when he took his own life in Oman. While this was a tragedy, he may have, in a weird way, saved some people's lives by getting them to focus on their own mental health. For instance, 
the DJs Hardwell, San Holo, and Shu all stopped touring for a little while to focus on their mental health, which is never a bad thing. Unfortunately, his girlfriend at the time, Emily Goldberg, also passed away, but she passed away recently on April 3, 2024, at the age of 34 from a pulmonary embolism. Unlike a lot of people, I do not still to this day consider him to be a legend. However, I do respect what he did, even though I was never really personally a huge fan of his work. And if I have to hear Wake Me Up One More Time, I'm gonna just go nuts. The song drives me absolutely crazy. It's not his best song in any event. He was not the first to put EDM and country together, by the way. That honor goes to the Swedish group, the Rednecks, back in 1994 with that gem Cotton Eye Joe, which some people remember still. But while putting the two genres together did not become a trend after Rednecks did it, it certainly became a trend after Avicii did it. In fact, without Avicii's skills for combining country and EDM, you definitely wouldn't have the current crop of country EDM artists out there working together, like combining Florida Georgia Line with virtually every EDM artist known to mankind. From that standpoint, Avicii will always have my respect because he was the first EDM guy to do it in the past 20 years differently than a lot of these other cut and paste guys out there. The late Tim Bergling, a.k.a. EDM DJ and producer and remixer Avicii, born September 8th, 1989. And that is it for the Music History In-Depth podcast for September 4th through the 10th. Thank you very, very much for listening and or watching. <laughs>